All right, coming up next, man, I've been so excited to talk about this guy who has a new book out that ostensibly was about Janet Yellen. And when I started reading about it, yes, you're going to learn about Janet Yellen, but you know what you're going to learn about even more? You're going to learn about the two main schools of thought that are constantly fighting this economic battle back and forth. And what are the differences between the two? Well, John Hilsenrath is the perfect guy to write this story because he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2014 for coverage of the Federal Reserve. He's been part of a Wall Street Journal team for a long, long, long time, twice voted among the nation's most influential financial journalists. We quote him quite often, John Hilsenrath. And here he is taking a seat at the card table. John Hilsenrath is here. How are you, man? Uh, I'm really good, and I'm really happy to be here. I, I think I'm in your mother's basement. It's uh, very happy to be here. <laughs> He's like, where am I? Where did I get kidnapped? How did I end up? <laughs> I, I thought I was writing for the Wall Street Journal. Now I'm in Texarkana. I don't know what's going on. I, I, Joe, I've been in much stranger places, so, uh, <laughs> so, so I'm good with this. Uh, why you and why this project, John? Because I find this a very interesting study, not just of, of, of Janet Yellen and how the Fed works, but also of just economics in general. Why why did you decide to take this on? Uh, wow. Well, all right. So, so there's a lot of facets to that answer. The, the, the main thing is I, I had the idea for this book, as most decent ideas uh, come to people in the shower, um, you know, when Janet Yellen was nominated by Joe Biden to be Treasury Secretary, uh, it, it it was obvious to me that this is a historic figure. She was uh, Treasury Secretary. She's now Treasury Secretary, former Fed chair, former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, the first person in American economic history to have those three jobs. And so then the question was, like, how do you write a story that people want to read? What makes her narrative worth hearing? And what, are, what occurred to me is that there's a love story here and a love story that I could use as a vehicle to tell a bigger economic story. So Yellen is married to George Akeloff, a Nobel Prize winner in his own right. And between the two of them, they've been in, in the middle of almost every major economic debate of the last 60 years. And so what occurred to me in the shower is if I, I could use them as the central characters to tell a much bigger and broader story about American economic upheaval, which is what I've been covering as a finance and economics writer at the Wall Street Journal for the last 26 years. So Yellen, I guess, is another way of saying she became selfishly my vehicle uh, to write about the stuff that I've been writing about for the last 26 years. I wanted to tell a bigger story and use her as a vehicle through which to do that. Well, and it's funny, John, when you say love story, there's obviously uh, the, the love story you mentioned, but I also picked up when I was reading it, there's another love story going on here. And I don't think this is by accident that th this woman loves, loves economics like that. There's a love story between her and just the practice of economics going on as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think for, I think for a lot of people uh, who kind of seek satisfaction in, in their work, uh, that's what you're looking for, right? You're looking to to do something that you find meaningful and purposeful. And she found that uh, through economics. You know, I think as we all know, um, you know, people say pursue your passion. Well, it's not like she jumps out of bed every morning, kind of raring to go and excited. <laughs> a lot of days, a lot of days, this you know, the work uh, that we do can be a hard grind. But it was something that she was drawn to because she it, it made her feel purposeful. And so you're right. Uh, there, there is a love story also in not only in her family story, but in the work she chose to do. And, you know, we could have a long discussion and debate about whether she's done it well. I think because, you know, the, the country is so partisan now, there are people who want to kind of say she's either great or a failure. You know, she's, you know, you're either red or you're blue. Uh, what I tried to do is get beyond that stuff and, and, and kind of, like I say, use her as an actual character to tell this, this bigger story, she's made mistakes and she's also made some good calls. Well, and people will, people will come down either side, not just because of politics, but also because of which, which economic camp they live in. And you dive into these two very different uh, uh, thought processes. People have these, 
these uh, underlying core values that these two different economic theories have. And I want to dive into that, but I want to start yeah. kind of where you start. You pick up your story in 2009 in your introduction. And Janet Yellen's running the San Francisco Fed. Most people, most of our stacker community, John, have no idea how the Fed's organized. What was the head of the San Francisco Federal Reserve responsible for? What was she doing at this point in 2009? Well, so let me say the San Francisco Fed is one of 12 regional Fed banks. Uh, The way the Fed is structured is there's 12 banks spread around the country, San Francisco, Atlanta, Kansas City, Boston, Uh, And then there's a Fed board in Washington where their Fed chair resides. And the Fed is set up this way for a reason. There's a long history of distrust in this country, dating all the way back to the debates between Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson about the creation of the first bank of the United States. There's a long history of distrust towards financial institutions. And when the Fed was created in 1913, that distrust was very much present. And they decided they didn't want all the power concentrated in Washington or New York. So they created these 12 regional Fed banks. And the San Francisco Fed is one of them. Yellen uh, and her husband, George Akeloff, had been professors uh, at at Berkeley, uh, University of California, Berkeley. And she was named to be president of the San Francisco Fed Uh, You can't hold me to these dates. I think it was around 2004, 2005. And so she was overseeing this vast swath of uh, the West, uh, not only monitoring the economies, but also playing a role in supervision of banks. And a lot of the banks that were heading towards serious trouble during the mortgage boom of the late 2000s were out West. Uh, My book documents some interesting confrontation she had with the CEO and founder of Countrywide Financial, uh, the mortgage company that ended up blowing up. And so she was kind of like the eyes and the ears for the Fed in the West. And she would go to these Fed policy meetings uh, once every uh, eight times a year uh, and kind of report uh, to other Fed officials. And she did such a good job, uh, at least that they felt at the Fed, of kind of laying out what was coming that they asked her to come to Washington to be the vice chair of the Fed in 2010. Well, and the scene that you go to, to, to make your point there is this Fed meeting. You write that Ben Bernanke, the Fed chairman's running the meeting. By the way, you describe him as a quote, socially awkward genius who has <laughs> this huge task of helping the country through this really huge crisis. Mm-hmm. And they're looking at all this data that shows the economy's picking up. But yet when he calls on Yellen, John, she reports it in San Francisco. It doesn't feel like a recovery. And it seems yeah. like she seems at this point in the game. And man, I remember 2009, like it was yesterday. And there's these critical moves I felt like that needed to be made or maybe didn't need to be made. And if we make them and we're going too far, are we not going far enough? But she yeah. seemed to be squarely in the, we need to lower interest rates further camp period. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so people ask me sometimes, well, what's her legacy? What did she actually do in these jobs that makes her matter. And and I think like you're putting your finger on that period. So we had this financial crisis that kind of rolled through the financial system from 2007 into well into 2008. By the summer of 2000, let me see, by the summer of 2009, uh, Barack Obama is elected president. There's this hope in Washington that the worst of the crisis is over and a recovery can set in. And Yellen is there at these Fed meetings. So saying, no, like with that, you know, we've gotten through the financial crisis, but we have another crisis on our hands, and that's an unemployment crisis. And you said, that, you said, by the way, John, that she and, and, and she doesn't give this off and her public persona that I've seen that she would get really passionate about stuff. But you, yeah. you, you have a different character here, one that really is forceful and, and can be very passionate. Yeah, yeah. She she surprised a lot of people at the Fed. And and in fact, she really upset some staff because she was so determined uh, to to pursue these policies that the Fed pursued after the financial crisis ended. You know, this phrase QE, quantitative easing, this was the Fed's efforts to bring down long term interest rates, uh, which was really pushed after the crisis ended. And she was very much at the center of pushing for those policies. Now, there was a lot of controversy about doing that. And that's where she stepped out on a limb and became one of Ben uh, Ben Bernanke's strongest advocates to push these levers to to keep working to get unemployment down. 
You transitioned into this discourse about two economists, Robert Schiller and George Akerlof, who you mentioned later was was her husband. Talk about these two people, though, and why they appear in the book. Besides the fact that George is her husband, why is George and Robert Schiller, why are they central characters to you as well? Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is because they're characters. They're just really interesting <laughs> people. You know, like one of my favorite stories in this book is Robert Schiller, Nobel Prize winner. Um, George and, and Schiller were, were skeptics of the kind of ec- economic um, orthodoxies. And Schiller is just a skeptic. He doesn't like when people mislead him. So one day, uh, this is really not part of the kind of bigger narrative of the book, but to give you a sense of what a character he is, Schiller's got a cat and he buys his cat food and the, the, the cat food says gourmet cat food. And Schiller's like, gourmet cat, like what's gourmet to a cat? He's like, I think they're lying in their marketing. So Schiller takes it one step further and he does a taste test. He lays out gourmet cat food versus regular cat food and taste them to see if there's any difference. Now, I don't know if a cat taste buds are different than a human taste buds, but he concludes that the cat, the pet food makers are lying because the gourmet pet food tastes just the same as the regular pet food. But this brings me to a broader point, which is that Schiller uh, and Akerlof but both set out from y- y- very young ages to test this idea that markets are efficient. Um, to challenge the idea that that markets are efficient, you know, which is really the kind of you, you talked about kind of uh, Chicago school economics. The foundation of Chicago school economics is the idea that markets are efficient, that they're, they're the best way of distributing kind of goods and work through um, through the economy is to let markets left to their own devices. And they both said, no, markets aren't efficient. You know, just look at the stock market like this is the most kind of uh, the, the the deepest, richest stock markets in the world. And Schiller concluded it's wildly inefficient. And so uh, Akerlof and Schiller kind of were, were two leading proponents in the idea that there's more to the way this capitalist system works than the orthodoxies had led us to believe. I, uh, w- when you say Chicago School of Economics, I want to I want to talk about this for a second, because this is uh, defined. They call it Chicago School of Economics because of Milton Friedman. Is that why? Uh, yeah, because a lot of the leading lights uh, in the kind of free market view of uh, of economics were at sh- at the University of Chicago in the nineteen fifties and sixties. Uh, Milton Friedman, but quite a number of others. Um, Eugene Fama, uh, who was oh, sure. kind of father of the efficient market theory. Uh, Gary Becker, who took this into social light, and. I mean, I, I think what I ought to do is back up a little bit. And this is where the, the, the book becomes a modern economic history. You know, so much of, of our kind of thinking about events and where we stand today is kind of rooted in history. And the world that Janet Yellen was born into uh, in the 1950s was a post-Depression, post-Great Depression world. And the guy who defined the post-Depression era was John Maynard Keynes, right? Keynes is this British economist who, by the way, as I lay out in my book, happened to be a bit of an anti-Semite. Um, and, uh, you know, Keynes came to the view that markets can't be left to their own devices and that when they were left to their own devices, we had this the Great Depression and the government has a role to play to move the economy forward when it gets stuck in uh, these overinvestment booms or credit bus. And uh, Friedman comes along, you know, after the Great Depression and, uh, and, you know, and when socialism is really sweeping through Europe uh, and and has already kind of swept through the Soviet Union and encroaching on other parts of Europe. And Friedman comes to the conclusion that this, this, you know, these views of socialism and Keynesianism of government's heavy hand in the economy is going too far. And he led a counter movement. And the counter movement to Keynesianism was, you know, this idea that that markets are best left to their own devices, that when you let markets function and don't interfere with them, they distribute goods efficiently, they hold inflation down, and they create the most jobs and the most prosperity for the most people. And really what we had 
for decades in that post-depression period were these great philosophical debates between people like Milton Friedman and then uh, the, the, the people who followed Keynes, who happened to be the mentor uh, of Janet Yellen and George Akerlof, people like Jim Tobin uh, and Paul Samuelson, who believed that the government had some role to play to help get the economy through, uh, through, through downturns. And that really defined the politics of the post-Great Depression era. You know, what is the role of government uh, in in managing the economy, and we still have those debates today. They've gotten somewhat muddied, I would say, uh, but um, uh, I won't go on about that. I'll let you uh, follow follow on. Well, no. So on that note, we've got the Chicago School, which I think a lot of people also call supply side economics, right? Yeah, those are just different terms. I believe, I think, for the same type of thing. It kind of is, have- but supply side is a, it's a strange term, you know. So I mean, as you know, you know, a market is based of supply and demand. You know, people consume goods and uh, and businesses produce them, and so. You know, the Keynesian movement was all about stimulating demand when the economy gets stuck in a rut. And and the, the Friedmanites were saying, no, we need to support the creation of more supply. OK, uh, I, I understand that. But but what they came to be defined as in the Reagan era is cut taxes and, and reduce regulation. But there are a lot of factors that go into supply. You know, yeah. for instance, you know, if if. When the government invests in in creating new airports, is that expanding supply? You know, that's why I, I kind of um, push back a little bit on the idea that um, supply side economics is the same thing as free markets. It gets a little complicated when you go there. But but it, and it is it is interesting how though people will use those terms interchangeably. And to your point, yeah. they they probably aren't. Uh, you mentioned this other character you just brought up, which is Tobin. How yeah. did she how did she get to know Tobin as a as a mentor? Walk me through Janet's early years and meeting right. him and uh and and really then the effect that he had single handedly, I think, on her economic outlook. Right. Oh yeah, you know, he had a huge effect on her. So Yellen is born uh in Brooklyn in the nineteen fifties. Uh her mother is a Jewish mother who nagged her children all the time, not only to get their homework done, but to make sure that they got their homework done properly. Yellen was not allowed to turn her homework in with any mistakes on it. Mom checked everything. So Yellen became somewhat neurotic as a child about doing all of her homework. Um her her father was a medical doctor. They sat around the dinner table in Brooklyn and, and talked about his patients. And I'm gonna get to Tobin, by the way. Um you know, and the the father would talk about problems like unemployment and how it affected the, an entire household, how it affected mental health or substance abuse or divorce. And so Yellen kind of was grew up with this view that unemployment was a was a problem. She also happened to be really good at math. She goes to Brown, by the way, uh, schools like Yale and Princeton weren't admitting women uh, back then. I, one of the big surprises to me in reporting this book was <laughs> what, what was just what a different world young, uh, talented young women lived in uh, who wanted to have a career. Um, she aces, she gets only one B in all of her studies, which is in German. And then she goes off to Yale. She's the only woman in her PhD class at Yale in the 1960s. And she is blown away by Jim Tobin. So Jim Tobin uh, is uh, had, had, had worked in Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors. He was this brilliant guy who had served in, in World War II. And he was a passionate individual uh, who believed strongly that in the ideas of Keynes, uh, in the idea that economics was not just this kind of abstract science that it could be used to improve the condition of humans, and that uh, that the, if the government kind of behaved um, uh, prudently, that it could do things to help people who lost jobs. And Yellen became a, a, a devoted follower, not just of Keynes, but also of Tobin. There's this one passage in the book where Milton Friedman from the Chicago School comes uh, to give a talk at Yale in the 1960s, 
you know, kind of espousing his views about how the government needs to just get out of the way. And Tobin challenges um, Friedman right there in person. And Yellen is right next to Tobin. And uh, she, she becomes really angry and agitated about Friedman's responses because she doesn't think that Friedman is giving straight answers. So she was like right there in the front row of these great debates uh, that, that were kind of set off by John Maynard Keynes after the Great Depression. And she took up the baton of uh, activist government and, and Keynesianism. You know, I would say just to move this forward a little bit, th that was early in her career. I think she would say that her what she's discovered as a policymaker, uh, which started in the 1990s, is that getting the right thing done is a huge challenge. There are so many obstacles uh, to, to prudent government action. Um, and a lot of her uh, work life has, has been about fighting through those obstacles and, and um, to try to get to good economic decisions that s s sometimes what you think is right in theory, it's very hard to achieve um, uh, for any number of reasons, you know, some of which is hard to know what's right. And then the other is just the political obstacles are are immense. You know, the, the, the vested interests in Washington that interfere with good decision making. And Yellen felt that not only in battles against Republicans, but in internal battles and political battles with Democrats in her own administrations. It's it's interesting, John, that 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 uh, uh, in a lot of ways, she's lockstep with Keynes uh, and Tobin. And by the way, you mentioned just offhand uh, uh, Keen's, uh, anti-Semitism. I, I had, I had never heard that before. And you walk into some of that, that just some awful, absolutely horrible, horrible, e even about Albert Einstein, for goodness sake. I mean, the yeah. guy was just, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, like that, brilliant. that was kind of the way people talked in, in his, his day, particularly in, in the UK, and I think some people kind of want to excuse him for it because, you know, he was such an important figure in economics. But, you know, what, what I'm trying to do in this book is just kind of examine interesting characters. I think, you know, like we, we just tend to paint people in black and white images. And I think everybody is a fascinating character worth really examining in full. You know, so in, another great character that I look at is Angela Mazzillo, this guy who ran Countrywide Financial and became kind of like the the uh, the poster child for all the bad things that financial companies did during the financial crisis. And uh, he certainly made a lot of mistakes. But he, like even Angela Mazzillo, as, as I try to re uh, report, made some pretty astute calls uh, late in the crisis. He was complaining that the Fed in 2006 – had been raising interest rates too much and that the Fed caused a crisis because, you know, all these mortgages had been taken out. They were adjustable rate mortgages and the Fed was jacking up rates. You know, uh, Mozilla was saying that that the Fed was going to cause a crisis and it did. And it took down countrywide. So I just don't like painting people as uh, in, in black and white images. I think the, the world is much more complex and interesting than that. And I find the really good stories happen when you examine the shades of gray. Well, and absolutely. I mean, if, if you've got Janet Yellen growing up in a Jewish family who is following the philosophy of a guy who's an anti-Semite, I mean, <laughs> there, there it is right there. But that leads me to my question. So you have her lockstep at this point with Keynes and with Tobin. Are there areas where you've seen where she really has branched out on her own, where she disagrees maybe with Keynes or with Tobin or has made some moves that's different than what she she grew up learning? How has she grown into really her own economic figure versus some of these larger than life people that came before her? That's a that's a really, really good question. You know, I, I think a lot of people um, would, would argue that even to this day, She's really kind of a, a, a textbook Keynesian. Um, but but I would say that where she's grown is because she's had to put these theories in practice, she's come to understand that the, the work of a policymaker uh, is prone to mistake and misjudgment and failure in the same way that the work of a market participant 
is prone to uh, mistake and misjudgment and failure. And which is so interesting because what her husband, George Akeloff, set out to do in his career was to demonstrate that markets are prone to mistake, misjudgment and failure. And he won his Nobel Prize for that. And uh, I, I think Yellen has discovered in her career just how hard the job of a policymaker is, too. Um, you know, the most stark example of that is is on inflation, right? So one of her first wake-up calls in the 1970s was, you, you know, a lot of the ideas of Keynesians were discredited during the 1970s because the government had pursued all these stimulative policies, and it led to an outbreak of sustained double-digit inflation. And I think, you know, the reason why Ronald Reagan became president and the Reagan that, reason that the Chicago School became ascendant uh, was because of those failures of, of the 1970s. And, you know, one of the kind of big intellectual challenges to Keynesianism was this idea of um, rational expectations that, like, if you let if, – if, if people start believing there's going to be inflation in the future – if businesses start believing there's going to be inflation in the future, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and uh, the, the government's job becomes much harder. And, and, you know, this was kind of in some ways a rejection of some of Tobin's ideas. And Yellen accepted that and became what was called a new Keynesian. Uh, and, you know, and then now uh, as Treasury Secretary, her biggest the biggest stain on her record as a policymaker is another outbreak of inflation uh, as uh, it, as Treasury Secretary for the Biden administration. And that's going to really, I think, ultimately define her legacy, whether they get inflation under control. Uh, and, and again, you know, I think she's turning to the ideas that you know were really advanced by Paul Volcker, that you have to have a central bank that's tough and that's going to stop inflation in its track before people believe that it's like embedded throughout the economy. I think I think this explains for people too, uh, as as we get clear on these two these two uh, uh, schools of thought, the Keynesian school of thought and the Chicago school of thought, why Donald Trump let Janet Yellen go. Obviously, he's he's uh, surrounding himself with much more Chicago school of thought people. She, t t t tell me this: you, you mentioned that she didn't want to be Treasury Secretary. Did she turn yeah. it down? Was that what did she turned it down? Yeah. The first time uh, Biden's emissaries approached her, she said no. She was happy with her re retirement well into her 70s and um, didn't uh, didn't feel like she had another run into her. You know, she liked getting to bed at 830 at night. And, um, and don't so, we all? I mean, come yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> so so she, she said no. And then they, they came back to her and she and her husband, George, and son, Robbie talked about it in the kitchen and they decided that um, she had a duty. You know, there was a financial crisis. There was another economic crisis with COVID. And when the president asks you to do a job, you do it, you serve. So she decided to do it. But Joe, I want to challenge you on something you said, which is uh, Trump let her go and surrounded himself with more um, Chicago school, with people with more of a Chicago school view of the world. I'm going to disagree with that. I, I, I think the orthodoxies of the post-Depression era have broken down in uh, the post-millennial era. So a great example of that is, you know, where did, where did President Trump stand on trade? Um, you know, a, a free market view of the world would be that trade is good, uh, that everyone is better off um, with free trade, uh, and that you should have kind of open markets, um, even open borders. Uh Trump challenged that. Uh, Trump also um, spent very aggressively when COVID happened. Uh, you know, it, it was the Trump administration first that sent out relief checks uh, and student loan, loan relief and apartment uh, uh, rental relief to millions and millions of households. The government was exceptionally interventionist um, in, in the COVID period. And so I think we're living in, in a new era in which the, the orthodoxies of the post-Depression era, these great debates between, you know, government and markets have evolved into something much different. Right now, they're being defined by simply, you know, are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? But 
I think the philosophical underpinning of how we think about and manage the economy is is changing is is, is changing pretty dramatically right now. And you know, I, I even in Chicago, the Chicago school is not the Chicago school anymore. Uh, you know, if, if you look at the the guy running the Becker Friedman Institute, uh, it's a guy named Michael Greenstone who served in the Obama administration and who's he, he grew up in Chicago. His mother was out protesting in front of Milton Friedman's home in the 1970s. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Austin Goolsby, who served in the uh, Obama administration, was at the uh, Chicago um, uh, School of Business, the Booth School of Business. So, you know, these old orthodoxies are changing under our, our feet and, you know, kind of. This becomes really one of the defining themes of, of the book. So we had you know, um, 60 years of debate about the proper role of, of, of government and markets in society and the economy. And w- what I come away thinking is that, uh, you know, what we've discovered, it, it's the, the, the book is about a marriage, right? It's about the marriage of George Akeloff and Janet Yellen. But it's also about another marriage. It's about the marriage between um, free markets and democratic government. Yeah. And what we've discovered in this 60-year period is that neither side is perfect. Both sides are populated by humans that are prone to misjudgment and mistake and overshooting. And that the, the challenge of our times has been finding the right mix uh, uh, of uh, democratic Govern, governance and market capitalism. Uh, and, and that mix, what holds the mix together is the institutions of society, the institutions that our founders built um, literally back, you know, after the Revolutionary War, uh, a court system that people trust, a free media that people trust, police that people trust, um, uh, rules of commerce that people trust. And for me, the, the biggest challenge of our times is the fact that trust in these institutions has broken down in the midst of all the turbulence that we've lived through in the last 20 years. You know, when we look at countries like Russia and China, which in their own ways have rejected the marriage we thought that they would embrace, a marriage of free markets and democratic capitalism, they both had their chance right when the Berlin Wall fell and after... Tiananmen Square, we tried to bring them into our system and and get them to embrace our system. And the last 20 years, we've discovered that they're not going to do that. They're not going to embrace the system that we did. And and we've discovered that the way they do it has its pitfalls. Um, Certainly in Russia, it does. And frankly, I think China isn't all that it's been cracked up to be. And if we look at them as a, as a mirror into ourselves, what we di- what, what I discovered writing this book, it gets back to what you're trying to talk about, this kind of long running debate about markets and government. Like we got to we have to keep the institutions that, that make this marriage work together. We've got and, you know, the founders, Alexander Hamilton talked about this. There's not some great nirvana where everything is perfect. It has to be. Work, as in any marriage, it has to be worked at, uh, and the challenges that you come up against as your marriage evolves, you got to keep working at, at at fixing these things, and it needs a lot of support and a lot of patience. And I, I'm afraid our marriage right now uh, is in an unhealthy place because of the social and political divides uh, that 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 we're living through, and and the distrust. And I've got to be very self-conscious about this. People don't trust the media. You know, whether you're, I mean, the one thing that that, that they agree about is whether you're red or you're blue, that like there's some part of the media that you distrust. And I think like for me as a journalist, every day I'm working at like, you know, how, how, how do you address that? How do you deal with that? How do you conduct yourself in a way that earns the right of people who look at you or listen to you and immediately think that you've got an agenda and you're trying to mislead them? Well, and it, it and it's sad because so often, and I'm glad you challenged me on that, John, because I firmly believe that what I really what I really enjoyed about this discussion, and 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 that I enjoyed in your book is it is a discussion about these philosophies, and you and I said this before we hit record today 
that I think most of us don't have any idea what the hell these underlying philosophies are that we supposedly believe in when we say that we're for this or we're for that. And so often even our country's leaders muddy the waters by, by you know, Trump acting in a very Keynesian way yeah. <laughs> to, to, right. to, to exert government control and then getting rid of the Keynesian in his government to, to, to replace with with. With, with, with somebody else. It's a, yeah. it's a, and that, that's why I also pushed you on the idea of supply side economics. It's like, so it, it, it's come to mean cut taxes and deregulate. But like, if you want to expand the supply side of the economy, there's like, there's other, there's other ways to do that. Those aren't the only two levers to pull. And I, you know, I do think that, that theoretically, uh, in many ways, our, our leaders, in media and in government are, are are kind of adrift right now. We don't, you know, we had these great debates about whether we should have more government or more market, and it's it's evolved into something we, where um, it, it's you know I, I think in some ways we've come to the conclusion that both sides are imperfect. But then the next step of the debate is how do we fix and repair and improve the institutions that keep both sides of the equation honest. The book is Yellen, the trailblazing economist who navigated an era of upheaval. Uh, we we just skimmed the surface. We just barely skimmed the surface of what you had. A job well done, man. Thank you so much for talking a little bit about economics and Janet Yellen and really where we're headed. Thanks. This was fun. I'd, I'd love to do it again if you want to do an episode two. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> You're on.